Global News and Zimo Nigeria. Thanks for joining me. We begin with Ukrainian leader accuses Russia of blackmail. Moscow launches latest air raids on Ukraine. Trump's petition dismissed by Georgian court. Thousand evacuated typhoon rocks China, Vietnam, and Kerry hopeful that climate meeting will boost ties. Talking Russia-Ukraine war, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said that no one has the right to damage the food security of any nation and the world has an opportunity to show Russia that it does not permit blackmail, describing the need to be secure from Russian madness following Moscow's withdrawal from the Black Sea Grain Deal on Monday. Zelensky said the export of grain from Ukraine's seaports should continue with or without Russia's participation. Ukraine's exports provided food security for 400 million people, he said, and Russia cannot be led to hold such an important supply ransom to its whims. If a bunch of people somewhere in the Kremlin think that they supposedly have the right to decide where the food will be on the table in different countries, in Egypt or Sudan, Yemen or Bangladesh, China or India, Turkey or Indonesia, then the world has an opportunity to show that blackmail is not allowed to anyone, Zelensky said. Everyone has a right to stability. Africa, the right to stability. Asia has the right to stability. Europe has every right to stability, and therefore we must all care about security, about protection from Russian madness, he said. The Black Sea Green Initiative can and should keep operating if without Russia, then without Russia, he added. Ukraine, along with the United Nations and Turkey, which brokered the original deal with Russia, can jointly continue the operation of the food corridor and the inspection of vessels, the Ukrainian leader said. On Monday, there was widespread condemnation and outcry over Russia's decision to end its participation in the deal, which allowed the export of Ukrainian grain from the country's black seaports. The agreement had assisted to ensure the price stability of vital universal commodities such as wheat, the year-old agreement, which officially expired at 21 o'clock GMT on Monday, was a lifeline for global food security and a beacon of hope in a troubled world, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said in New York. Guterres said he was deeply disappointed that a letter he sent to Russian President Vladimir Putin last week with proposals to save the agreement went unheeded. Ultimately, participation in this agreement is a choice, Guterres said, but struggling people everywhere and developing countries don't have a choice. Hundreds of millions of people face hunger and consumers are confronting a global cost of living crisis, he added. Still ro talking Russia-Ukraine war, Ukraine's Air Force said Russia has launched air raids on aims in southern and eastern Ukraine using drones and possibly ballistic missiles to southern post port rather of Odessa and the Mykolaiv, Donetsk, Kherson, Zaporizhia and the Dnipro-Tresfok region were all under threat of Russian drones attacks, the Air Force said in the early hours of Tuesday morning. It's quite serious, Mykolaiv's mayor Oleksandr Senkevich said on, the, uh, on social media, adding that more detail on the fire will be released later in the morning. Footage circulated on social media claimed to show Iranian mid slash drones attacking targets in the Mykolaiv region. There was no independent confirmation of the attack or the authenticity of the footage. Ole Kipa, the head of the Odessa's region's military administration, said air defense systems there were engaged in repelling numerous waves of Russian drone attacks. Russia may also be using ballistic weaponry to attack the regions of Poltava, Cherkasy, the Dnipro Trovence, Kharkiv and Kirovorad, the Air Force added. Air raid alerts sounded in several Ukrainian regions for hours on Tuesday morning before being called off at about 4.30 a.m. local time. Seri Bratchuk, a spokesperson for Ukraine's Odessa military administration, said on Telegram that details of the attack there will be released later. Thank you all for your endurance, he said. The attack on the Odessa region in southern Ukraine, which is home to maritime terminals, comes hours after Russia refused to extend a deal allowing the safe export of Ukrainian grain from back seaports. On judicial matters, the Georgia Supreme Court has voted solidly to discharge a petition from the former United States President Donald Trump seeking to stop an inquiry into potential election interference during the 2020 race. The state court rejected Trump's allegation that his constitutional rights had been trampled in a five-page opinion released on Monday. 
It was a notably quick decision, arriving three days after Trump's legal team had issued its petition on Friday to bar Fulton County District Attorney Fanny Willis from filing charges against him. Willis has probed Trump since 2021 over accusations that he sought to overturn Georgia's presidential election results, which showed the Republican incumbent narrowly losing to Democrat Joe Biden in the state. In addition to limiting Willis' ability to prosecute, Friday's petition also sought to suppress a special grand jury report from the investigation that has yet to be released in full. That request was also denied in Monday's decision. The petitioner has not shown that he will be entitled to the relief he seeks, the nine-member panel wrote. The court noted that Trump had not presented either or the facts of the law necessary to mandate Willis' disqualification. It also found that no violation of defendants' constitutional rights and no structural defect in the grand jury process occurred, leaving no basis to suppress the grand jury's report. The rapid nature of the proceedings comes as Trump's legal team attempts to save off legal proceedings expected in the state. Now on weather and climate, in southern China and Vietnam, thousands of people have fled their homes as powerful typhoon made landfall, prompting flood warnings and the cancellation of hundreds of flights and trains. The China Meteorological Administration said that Typhoon Talim, the fourth typhoon of the year, rumbled ashore on the coast of Guangdong province at roughly 10.20 p.m. local time, 14.20 GMT on Monday night, bearing maximum winds of 136.8 km per hour. Storm swells and lashing rains also hammered the southern coastline from Guangdong to Hainan province, the Meteorological Administration said. According to reports, an orange weather alert, the second highest warning in a four-tier color-coded system, was issued and closely 230,000 people in Guangdong were evacuated to safety as of 5 p.m. local time on Monday. Chinese authorities ordered the shutdown of dozens of coastal tourist destinations, while 11 rescue vessels, 5 helicopters, 46 salvage ships and 8 emergency rescue teams were on standby to respond to the storm. It added, Talim is anticipated to move to the Beibu Gulf in the South China Sea and the Meteorological Administration cautioned that a typhoon may make a second landfall in the coastal area of Guangzhou. Autonomous region on Tuesday morning. Parts of Gingzia were told to brace for flash floods through Tuesday. People watch big waves at sea shore as Typhoon Talim approaches in Boao in China's southern Hainan province in July 17, 2023. On Monday in Vietnam, authorities said they were getting ready to evacuate about 30,000 people from the areas forecast to be hardest heat in Quang Hini and Haifeng provinces. Talim might be one of the biggest to hit the Gulf of Tonkin in recent years, Vietnam's top disaster response committee said in an online statement. Tourists have been advised to leave outlying islands and airlines have rescheduled services to avoid the storm. From Minh Chin, Vietnamese Prime Minister warned of possible floods late on Sunday and directed disaster response teams to prepare for immediate rescue and relief walks. Hundreds of trains in South Southern China's Guangdong and Hainan, including high-speed trains between Guangzhou and Shenzhen, the metropolis adjacent to Hong Kong, were also on hold on Monday, reports said, citing local service operators. Authorities on Hainan Island asked ships in nearby waters to return to port after the local marine forecasting station warned of waves of up to 6 meters, 20 feet, more reports said. Milan International Airport and Kohai Boa Airport, both on Hainan Island, have cancelled all flights. Flight Aware, the international flight tracking website, put that figure at over 160 cancellations of flights into and out of the island on Monday. Zuhua Jinwan Airport in Guangdong near Macau cancelled over 80 flights, local media said. Scientists have cautioned that typhoons are becoming more powerful as the world gets warmer with climate change. Still talking weather and climate, the United States envoy in climate, John Kerry, has held meetings with China's top diplomat in Beijing, calling for cooperation to address global warming and to redefine the troubled diplomatic ties between the world's two biggest greenhouse gas emitters. On Tuesday, Kerry told Wang Yi that climate talks could provide a fresh start for U.S.-China relations, which have been stalled in clashes over issues including trade, technology and the self-governed island of Taiwan. 
Our hope is that this can be the beginning of a new definition of cooperation and capacity to resolve differences between us, Kerry told Wang in the meeting at Beijing's Great Hall of the People. We are very hopeful that this can be the beginning not just of a conversation between you and me and us on the climate track, but that we can begin to change the broader relationship, he said. Kerry is the third senior U.S. official in recent weeks to travel to China for meetings with their counterparts there after Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. China broke off some mid- and high-level contacts with the administration of U.S. President Joe Biden last year, including over climate issues, to show its rage with then House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan in August. Beijing considers the democratically governed island part of its territory. Other problems have hit relations since then, including the transit across the U.S. of what Biden administration officials said was a Chinese spy balloon. Kerry told Wang that Biden was very committed to stability within this relationship, but also to achieve efforts together that can make a significant difference to the world. From experience, if we work at ease, we can find the path again in its ways that resolve these challenges, Kerry said. The world is really looking to us for that leadership, particularly on the climate issue. For his part, Wang Yi described Kerry as my old friend, saying they have worked together to solve a series of problems between both sides. He praised Kerry and his Chinese counterpart, Xi Zhenghua, for their hard work during the 12 hours of talks they held in Beijing. On Monday, U.S. officials have refused to comment on the Kerry Xi deliberations. Beijing said after the talks that climate change is a common challenge faced by all mankind. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning said China will exchange views with the United States on issues connected to climate change and work together to meet challenges and increase the well-being of present and future generations. As the leading emitter of the greenhouse gases driving climate change, China has promised to make sure its carbon emissions peak by 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. The Biden administration targets to decarbonize the U.S. economy by 2050. While Kerry has sought to ring first climate issues from wider diplomatic disputes, China has said that cooperation on global warming could not be separated from broader fears. In a commentary published on Sunday, recent U.S.-China official interactions are a good sign for preventing further miscalculations and steering bilateral relations back on track. But he added that Beijing was seeking more concessions on the political side, something the U.S. has said it will not provide. And in Africa, several killed in Cairo building collapse. On Monday in Egypt's capital, Cairo, eight people, including seven members of one family, were killed when a residential building collapsed, the public prosecution and report said. A statement from the public prosecution said the building in the city's Hadiyak al Kuba district completely collapsed, killing eight people. Civil defense workers pulled out nine people, among them a wounded woman, while the eight others were diseased, the statement said, adding that another five were able to leave the property before it fell down. It said the woman and two residents gave testimony suggesting that the collapse was caused by a resident who recently knocked down walls in his first floor flat despite neighbors asking him not to do so. The prosecution ordered the arrest of the building's owner, the contractor in charge of the works, and one of his employees for questioning. A large portion of the buildings in central Cairo date back to the 19th and early 20th centuries and many are dilapidated or in some cases have been abandoned. Egypt has seen a number of deadly building collapses in recent years, both because of the poor state of some and also because of non-compliance with building and town planning regulations. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, I'll bring you more stories, particularly from Nigeria. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's Zuma Nigeria now. We begin with APC confirms Adamu's resignation as Kiari steps in. Abubakar Kiari, Deputy National Chairman North of the All Progressives Congress, APC, has taken over the leadership of the party on an acting capacity following the resignation of the National Chairman Abdullahi Adamu. On Monday, Kerry announced the resignation of Adamu after a meeting of the National Working Committee, NWC, at the party's headquarters in Abuja. The acting chairman and ex-senator after the NWC meeting said he was taken over based on the provision of the constitution of the APC. 
He announced that the National Secretary, Ayola Amushuri, who also resigned and has been replaced by the Deputy National Secretary, Festus Fonta, from Plateau State. According to him, with this development and according to the APC Constitution, it is now incumbent on my humble self as the Deputy Chairman North to assume the office as the Acting National Chairman of the APC and subsequently also the Deputy National Secretary, Festus Fonta, will now assume the office of Acting National Secretary, he said. Mr. Carey also announced the postponement of the National Executive Council, NEC, previously scheduled for 19th July. He said, and I quote, with the recent developments with the change of leadership, we would like to inform everyone here that the proposed National Caucus meeting slated for 18th July 2023 and the National Executive Council for 19th July 2023 are hereby postponed. This postponement will not be indefinitely, but a new date will be communicated soon. The he acting chairman did not give the reason for the resignation of Adamu, but said it was a voluntary resignation. Adamu and Omoshori, however, face allegations of mismanagement of funds. Sally, who Mustafa Vice Chairman Northwest had accused the duo of mismanagement of funds. Mr. Adamu 77 was the fourth national chairman of the APC since the party's formation in 2013. He was a senator representing Nasrao West before his emergence on consensus as a national chairman of the ruling party in March 2022. He also served as the Nasrao state governor between 1999 and 2007 on the platform of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, and minister of state for works during the military administration of Sani Abacha. On his part, Mr. Omoshuri is a former deputy governor of Oshun State on the ticket of the Alliance for Democracy, AD, and senator representing Oshun East on the platform of the PDP. Still ahead on the news, first case of anthrax confirmed in Nigeria. On Monday, the federal government, through the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, officially confirmed the first case of anthrax in the country. Animals showing signs of a possible case of anthrax on a farm in Suleja, Niger State, were reported to the office of the Chief Veterinary Officer of Nigeria on July 14, 2023, according to a statement signed by the Chief Veterinary Officer of Nigeria, Dr. Kolumba T. Vakuru. The statement reads in part, the case was in a multi-species animal farm comprising of cattle, sheep and goats located at Gajiri along Abuja Kaduna Expressway, Suleja, local government area of Niger State where some of the animals had symptoms including oozing of blood from their body openings, anus, nose, eyes and ears. Related post-poultry industry on verge of total collapse, pan to Tinibu, India will collaborate with Nigeria in energy transition agenda. High Commissioner Stanchard in sales agreements with Axis Bank in five African countries affirms commitment to Nigeria. A rapid response team comprising of federal and states one health professional team visited the farm to conduct preliminary investigations and collected samples from the sick animals. Subsequent laboratory tests by the National Veterinary Research Institute Laboratory confirmed the diagnosis, marking the first recorded case of anthrax in Nigeria in recent years. Remember that the federal government had issued a warning to Nigerians a week ago after a report of anthrax outbreak in northern Ghana, where all infected animals had died. Anthrax is a disease caused by the spore-forming bacterium Bacillus, though, most affects, though mostly affects livestock like cattle, sheep and goats, but can also infect people who come in contact with infected people or contaminated animal products like meat, wool or skins. Anthrax that spreads via the skin might result through open wounds or contact with contaminated objects, while anthrax that spreads through the air can happen when spores are inhaled. Nigerians are instructed to immediately report cases of animals bleeding from body openings to veterinary authorities or agriculture extension workers, according to the statement. The blood of an anthrax-infected animal does not clot, do not process or move the dead or sick animal. Quickly report to your veterinary doctor or veterinary authorities at the Ministry of Agriculture in your state, the statement added. And finally, on the news, Nigeria's inflation reaches 22.79% last month. According to data by the National Bureau of Statistics, NBC, NBS rather released on Monday, Nigeria's headline inflation rate augmented for the sixth consecutive time to 22.79% in June 2023. 
the inflation rate in Africa's biggest economy rose to a fresh 17-year high of 22.79% in June 2023 from 22.41% in prior month. The NBS report read, read, in June 2023, the headline inflation rate rose to 22.79% relative to May 2023 headline inflation rate, which was 22.41%. Looking at the movement, the June 2023 headline inflation rate showed an increase of 0.38 percentage points when compared to May 2023 headline inflation rate. On a year-on-year -year basis, the headline inflation rate was 4.19 percentage points higher compared to the rate recorded in June 2022, which was 18.60 percent. This shows that the headline inflation rate year-on-year -year basis increased in June 2023 when compared to the same month in the preceding year. Food and non-alcoholic beverages surged to 11.81 percent, led, led the list of items that added to the growing inflation figure. The World Bank had estimated that the removal of fuel subsidy will add to the country's increase in inflation. The removal of the petrol subsidy is expected to cause a temporary surge in inflation in the upcoming months before contributing to disinflation in the medium term, the bank said in its June 2023 Nigeria development update. And the main news again, Ukrainian leader accuses Russia of blackmail. Moscow launches latest air raids in Ukraine. Trump's petition dismissed by Georgian courts. Thousands evacuate as typhoon rocks China, Vietnam and Kerry hopeful that climate meeting will boost ties. That's all on the news. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day.